Hey, I'm Laura. Thanks for watching this undistracted interview. Caleb Chapman is the frontman of American indie rock band Colony House. His Grammy winning dad, Stephen Curtis Chapman, gave him a taste of the music industry at a really early age. And in this undistracted interview, we talk about Caleb's musical mission, why being intentional is important to him, and also what it was like sharing one of his greatest moments of grief with the world. things first though how are you like actually how are you doing what's your state of mind right now I feel pretty good I'm doing pretty good I, uh you know we're all on this like wild ride together right now um but it feels like there's a light at the end of this tunnel we recently announced a tour which felt like all things really familiar and foreign at the same time it was yeah. like oh, this is what we do. This feels right. But also like, oh, w what are the things that we're forgetting about? Because it's been a year and a half since we've since we've done this. So mm. um, but I've I, it's been amazing to be spend so much time with family. Um, uh, a lot of like fun, just domestic life stuff, you know, <laughs> like that we don't usually get to dive into. It's like, you know, working on your yard. I'm like, right. my wife is kind of like, uh, sorry, you have to, you know, mow the lawn again <laughs> this week. And I'm like, I love this. It, <laughs> How long do you I think? I love this. Is that going to last for very long though? The enjoyment of it? Who knows? I've, but I'll enjoy it while the enjoyment lasts, you know? <laughs> uh, it is like, it's just a, it's a, it's something we, you, we take for granted when we're, when we're, on the road all the time you kind of miss those little simple things in life that mm. like kind of bring you back so and maybe you can explain something for us because being in Australia I get really excited when the bands that I love like Colony House like so many others announce that they're doing these world tours and then I look at the dates <laughs> and I'm like guys Going around the American states <laughs> is not a world tour. And then maybe, oh, there, maybe there's a Canadian date that's chucked in there that I didn't notice. Yeah, Can you explain? Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Did we say what? Who knows? You know, everyone's <laughs> saying different things. World tour. Yeah, I You're don't right. know. I try to, I'm, I'm responsible for a lot of the like um, graphic work. So like I was pretty intentional on this re most recent poster to put North America mm -hmm. 2021. Yeah, I don't want to blame uh, you for, I, for every band's okay. mistakes, but I feel like you would yeah. have an insight into why they do it. No, I'm honestly, if for uh, for us at least, um, we've only really done one world tour. And like our last, our last tour was going to be, before the pandemic, was going to be kind of the cycle that like we really were like digging into our team. Like we, we want to get overseas you know whether, whether i mean we've never played in australia mm, i'm as waiting a, as colony house <laughs> so oh trust us i mean one of our hot spots at least on the back end of some of our uh of our um you know spotify or whatever is like i mean i think sydney's up there mm. so we've got a good excuse yeah i mean look it might just be me listening so it could just be my own spotify habits you know what Hey, we've played to it. less people than just one. So, <laughs> so it's so good. But when did when did music become the thing that you were really wanted to give your time to? I mean, and some people may or may not know your dad's in music, Stephen Curtis Chapman. So I feel like you kind of grew up in music. But when did you want to yeah. own it for yourself? Because I feel like there's a big difference in that. Um. Well, I you know me and my brother, who's in the band as well grew up watching dad and it was like I don't ever remember thinking well I might I might do that or I might do something else it's, it was always like well when I get old enough I'll I'll do what dad does that was as a kid that's what the thought was mm. um when it became a reality was in high school my dad uh offered me and my brother an audition so to speak for his band and he was like look boys if you can pull this off you can you can start touring with me which was the I mean that sounded like the dream you yeah. know um and so we did we practiced and practiced and practiced and became my dad's band in high school um and so we would tour 
when he would tour and then we'd come back to school, the bus would drop us off. And uh, it was awesome. Yeah. Did it They're, bother you that it made that did it bother you that he made you audition though, or were you okay with that? Oh, it's fine. I mean, for uh, for what audition means for most people, we probably had it pretty easy. It was our audition was like, hey, we I have a show in Estes Park, Colorado, and I'll let you do this show with me. And if you can pull it off, then we'll keep we'll keep <laughs> rolling. So we pulled yeah. it off. Um, it was amazing. And we did that with my dad for six, five, five or six years. Mm. And then a couple years after we graduated, um, me and my brother kind of started feeling that pool more and more. Uh, you know, we had a middle school band and a high school band. And then as we as we kind of entered the next phase of life, mm. um, we started kind of trying to dial in exactly what we wanted to do. And it mm. and it slowly formed into what is now colony house um but we've been all speaking of world tours my dad has let us you know tag along all over the place we <laughs> including australia we have played music in australia just not as as colony house yeah so we need to kind of rectify that but i feel like whenever you come from a musical family for better or worse there's this kind of assumption that it's like oh you, you know you're following the footsteps you probably don't love that you've got that kind of heritage in the space was that ever an issue for you guys and, and kind of finding your own voice like establishing your own band or have you just kind of loved it and kind of walked in it without any kind of issues at all um it never felt like an issue I think when we were younger uh like right out of high school we felt like we had to prove ourselves a little bit more but that wasn't because of anything my dad anything really related to him it was more related to the industry mm. of just like you know um we never felt like we were gonna do exactly what my dad did with his career maybe it was it would look a little different like you know format wise or you know genre but it's amazing what his legacy and just the like kind of intentionality in his career what doors it's open for us and we would mm. be pretty we would be very foolish not to to uh embrace that and just to claim it and say like he did good work and that has that has paved the way for me and my brother to like probably skip out on a lot of of like <laughs> headache and let hard lessons learned that's not to say that we haven't you know paid a lot of dues mm. um uh and but it uh, yeah we've always been really thankful for for the kind of the i don't know the shortcuts we've been mm. able to take well, because and it, of that and also yeah. you know pave our own way while we're at it yeah too. well i mean at least you can admit that and, and like you know and and recognize that there has been open doors for you because of the heritage you come from but i would not say in any way that you guys have taken advantage of that or that you haven't had challenges in your own right because it's taken a long time for colony house to establish itself as a band for you guys to really mm -hmm kind of, even though you've played festivals and you've obviously got this great community of other artists around you, I don't think you've had a shortcut to, you know, the, the number one hits and the kind of glory yeah. that comes with being this amazing, amazing band. So I feel like, you know, at least yeah. be confident that it doesn't look like from the outside, you've kind of skipped a few steps, but it certainly has, you know, kind of placed you in a really great community of other musicians and mentors. And I wonder for guys yeah. like Switchfoot, who I know that you're great mates with and, and need to breathe and kind of others of that caliber, what are the sort of things that those guys really teach you, not just as musicians, but, you know, as men and as people further down the line, a little bit older with families, what are the sorts of things you're gleaning from them that help you shape your own life? Yeah. Um, well, yeah, I mean, those two bands specifically have been so encouraging along the road and have been champions of ours, you know, and I, I, we spend as much time like pulling that wisdom from them when we can, uh, from need to breathe specifically, they've always had this incredible, um, mentality with their live show of no matter you know they they were it was a similar thing with them of they spent about 10 years in their van and trailer um before they kind of made the bump up into a bus 
And so we were always, whenever we tour with them, chasing them in our van and trailer. <laughs> and they were, they were just like, they always encouraged us to like, think of ourselves as headliners and think of ourselves at like, every time you come back to a city, just bump it up a notch, like kind of simple, simple, like measurements that have like, kind of been their way of growth and um and watching them continue to like kind of build on top of their even still building and building building on top of what they continue to do uh is inspiring just logistically mm. um and then countless conversations about really defining your you know the mission of the band choose words that you can uh choose words that you can receive offers from and like put them into that like mission statement and say, does this make sense for the band? Mm. You know, finances aside, all of that, does this fit the band's kind of motivation, you know? Right. And, and that really helps you make decisions on, on saying yes and no to different projects and things like that. The Switchfoot mm. guys, uh, if you've ever, you know, had any small or significant run in with them, it's all the same. They're amazing people who have proven that you can be a rock and roll band and also live in humility and, um, and have us, you know, have family mm. and do that well and still travel the world and play music. Um, and sing you know sing songs that that really like touch you know, down deep uh in in the human soul so yeah. they've been like big brothers feels sometimes like fathers like the the amount of wisdom that they've mm. passed on so i could go on and on about <laughs> how much they meant yeah. to us but i mean the mentorship aspect is so important and i think you, you bring up two really significant things there one about how you know you had to kind of see yourself as the headliners right before you necessarily were playing these massive shows and for many of our listeners they they may not be in music so many won't get to you know yeah. kind of be on the stages that you guys do but I think that mentality of like seeing yourself as the thing that you want to be and kind of lifting the bar internally so that it's like you are a leader before you're a leader for instance that seems like a yeah. really significant kind of thing to do yeah yeah, I think that's I think there's a lot of truth in that. And and there's a way to do that. Like I said, I think people like Switchfoot, it like in humility where it's like respect yourself, respect uh, the potential platform, no matter how large or small it is, um, you know, and while not taking yourself too seriously, yeah. you know, take what you do seriously and, and know that it could have an impact on on someone, mm. you know. So yeah, and, and um, it's 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 big. But for you personally, in terms of talking of mission or the thing that is your filter for the things you say yes to and no to, what's that boundary line for you? What's the filter there? Hmm. I think it's it's constantly being defined um, and maybe redefined. There's you know artists go through seasons where you you know you weigh certain opportunities um, and and have to make a decision as a group, as an entity on whether or not you're going to take an opportunity, whether that's a tour or, you know, a podcast or things, you know, things like that, that you just kind of weigh as, as a brand, mm. you know? Um, but also for us, you know, the music that we're making as colony house, as you kind of experiment in that funnel, seems like the material kind of starts going down, further in the funnel and you're starting to go with every album like oh this is what we're what we want to say mm. the type of thing we want to say the type of emotion that we want to evoke and the kind of things we want people to be thinking about yeah. um i think for colony house there's this there's we always want to be tangible um and re like it feel like you can have a conversation with us um, and that's important how we present a show and how we present mm. ourselves online because that's just part of our lives, you know, now yeah. with what we do. Like it, we, as much as we want 
it to feel larger than life for the art aspect, we don't want to feel larger than life. Mm. Um, and so those are important decisions I think we make when we're putting a show together. Um, and then, you know, song wise, we, you know, I think that is even becoming a thing where it's like, we want to say deep, meaningful things that make you think outside of yourself and about this life mm. and the gift that it is and the tragedy that it can be. But we also want you to remind you that like, it's okay to just be, to have fun yeah. and like, and not take everything so serious. It's mm. part of like why we'll put out songs that some people will be like, doesn't feel like you're saying much. And it's like, sometimes <laughs> you go out, sometimes you go to coffee and you just talk about like, like a football Anything. game or something, yeah. you know? And that's what I think it's important for Colony House to, to be that voice too, mm -hmm. where it's just like, we don't always have to talk about the deep, deep, <laughs> dark stuff. It will get there. Yeah. We'll get there, you yeah. know? <laughs> but you'll have fun kind of in the midst of it, which I think is a real gift that you guys bring. And I think, you know, hope, bringing the, the ideas of hope and fun and just like laughter and perspective on stuff is, is huge in what you guys really do as well. And I'm glad this podcast made the cut of things that you felt like, you know, you wanted to be part of that you were interested in. So <laughs> it, it, that kind of brings the question up for me then. Why is living an intentional life, one that is undistracted, one that kind of clears out some of that clutter and focuses on what matters? Why is that important to you? Oh, man. Uh, that's almost like not not in a way I wouldn't answer, but a personal question of just like we are more than ever. I think the world uh, is just is every feels like around every corner someone's just begging for your attention um something some product some show some sort you know like we're just um yeah there's so many pools to get our brains thinking about something other than maybe just the life that we have the gift of living mm. uh and i think the the gift of that life is usually the community we've created around us. So for me, um, I think living intentionally, which is a constant struggle, uh, is to, to make sure I'm present in the moments I have, you know, and, and that's with my children, my wife, my, my bandmates, you know, it's not just about recording songs. It's about like really investing in each other's lives. And I think we have to make really intentional decisions, simple, silly decisions sometimes of like mm. putting your phone down and, and in a little corner of your house, that's the phone zone, you know, like that kind <laughs> yeah. of stuff. It's like, they seem so kind of Sunday school, cheesy, practical things that mm. that's like kind of the art of liturgy, you know, is like, we have to practice these things over and over again. And that's what intentionality is mm. i think in definition yeah you know? what are what are the markers in your life when things are getting off track like I, I know for me if my brain is just kind of scattered all over the place i'm like okay wait i need to just sit for a second regroup what the heck mm. is going on for you what are the things that show you stuff's maybe not quite right you're not really settled maybe you're not going in the direction that you're really meant to be mm. um unrest like in my spirit um what and probably in my physical like being like not being able to sleep uh which is is like i know i'm spending too much time looking at what other people are accomplishing when i'm when my brain's going on all the things that i haven't accomplished yet mm. that that i think is that sign of um i'm looking way too I'm, lo I'm looking way too far out uh, when I have kind of, I have to deal with the stuff right around me. Mm. Uh, and so, you know, like, I think something I do often when I feel that is, you know, go on a run, but I never take, I never take anything with me when I run, no mm. phone, no ear pods, none of that. And, and usually I run further than I can run back. So I have to <laughs> intentionally walk for mm -hmm. at least 30 minutes. And I think there's just, other than the exercise, there's just proof 
in silence in those still moments in our life. Mm. Um, like, you know, for me, that's where God is and, and where I don't even have to be in a conversation to hear something. Mm. Um, and, or to feel peace. Right. And I think that's just because we live in a really distracting world. And it's incredible. You know, wh- why do people go to the mountains? Why do people go to the river mm. and feel at peace there? I'm like, I think there's just, <laughs> I think it's pretty simple. It's because we're, we're not, we've ripped away all that distraction. You know? mm. So I think when I'm distracted, probably when I'm easily distracted and starting to feel anxious, yeah. Um, and maybe even like, sometimes you overbook yourself, you right. over, you, you put too much on your plate because you're out of fear that you're not accomplishing enough, mm. you know? And I think that is the challenge for someone who works in an industry that's about art, that's about writing, that's about a, a certain level of visibility in terms of, you know, what playlist you're appearing on, what radio stations you're played on, all of that kind of stuff. There's a lot of pressure to constantly be producing and constantly be kind of seen. But then also, as you've mm-hmm. mentioned, you're, you know, you're a dad, you're a husband in the midst of this as well. How do you kind of approach that tension of living this really amazing life as an artist, as a creator, but then also knowing that that is something that is, you know, feeding your kids is kind of, Mm. you know, providing life to a whole bunch of other people. How do you deal with that tension between creativity, loving the dream, and also being like a responsible father and husband as well? Yeah. Um, I think I have a pretty good I have a pretty good role model and I, I, I grew up underneath what I do and I still love my dad. (laughs) So (laughs) I have the gift of knowing it's possible Hmm. to live this life of traveling and kind of, you know, losing yourself into your art while not losing touch with, you know, what's actually really important, your family and your, your, life you know um, with the people you love um and so as I do kind of my homework and research as I look back on my childhood being like you know I know my dad was gone a lot but I didn't feel like like I don't feel like that in Mm. my memories I don't feel like he was gone a lot um and so I think as cliche as it is it's about just being there when you are there and obviously being smart on how much you're gone, but really, you know, uh, it's so easy to tap, you know, kind of tap out even when you, when you get home, Mm. um, when you're tired and all that. So, uh, I mean, I know that that feels like a a pretty simple and cliche answer, but I think there's truth in that of just being intentional to use that word again, uh, with the time that we have together. Mm. Um, and I think, I just think there's a gift to seeing your parents do something that they have per they feel that purpose in. And there's some, there's a gift. I've watched my dad struggle still and toil with his craft and it beats him up and it eats him alive. Mm. And as hard as sad, as hard as that is, and as sad as it is sometimes to see an artist kind of like crumbling inside of themselves, it's also this gift to see, someone care that much after all this time to say they're willing to fight for that. Mm. Um, They're willing to fight for the person on the other side of that speaker who is in either their lowest moment or maybe their highest moment. Yeah. Um, That's a cool thing to bear witness to Mm. um, as, as a kid, you know, watching, watching your parents do something like that. It's a very admirable and some might say like enviable example that you and your family, your siblings have really been set. And I know that you know, this is something particularly as an artist you probably wrestle with, but I think like many of us do, is how how authentic and how much of ourselves we're going to show or be to the people around us. And I hope this isn't too personal a question, so forgive me if it is, you know, um, but I know your family have been looked at so many times in the past and 
and had to share stories of your own grief when one of your little sisters was lost in tragic circumstances. And there you are, I watched an interview, Larry King, like as young mm-hmm. teenagers being asked so deeply about one of the most tragic, most difficult moments in your life. How do you know, yeah. like, what of yourself to share, what, vulner- what level of vulnerability to offer and what to actually kind of shield from people because it was a big thing to have to be so open with so much of the world. Yeah. You know, we were, uh, me and my, my siblings were pretty young. Uh, I mean, not, we were 18, 17, 18. So I guess that's relative, but I think in hindsight, maybe our family would have done that a little differently. Uh, We don't, not that we regret it. I think it was a beautiful testimony and a beautiful way to kind of openly share hope you know in grief and so there um there is no there's no remorse in that i do think the world has changed so drastically since then and how much of our lives we can share you know with other people with the platforms of you know instagram and and all the social media stuff um and so it, it feels like you have to be more intentional to be protective of, mm. of that aspect of your life. Uh, as for that kind of stuff, my fam, my dad and, and mom always, I think that's why probably they're still married in, <laughs> in an industry that like, uh, you're, you know, you want to be able to have it all together because you want to represent you know, your faith well and the family aspect of it well. Mm. And um, not that we've put it on full display on how dark it can get, Mm. but my, my parents haven't really shied away from like being brutally honest on the trials of marriage and mental health. And Mm. they've both written books that kind of expose so many things like that, which is so admirable. um, But also a really intentional decision. And at that point, uh, we were, you know, being led by them and, and we're all willing, they would never put us in a right. position that we felt uncomfortable with, but it's hard. Those are just those things you take as they come. And, uh, you know, sometimes I wonder what if it been healthier to grieve a little more privately, mm. you know, maybe, but our family is still whole and, uh, and that's the, that's what's so beautiful about it is like, you just kind of, you take it in stride, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. So I don't know if that really answered the question. No, it does, it's something you... that, yeah. Something we've kind of talked, we continue to talk about. What have we done that the same? Yeah. Maybe, maybe so, maybe not. We're proud of our, how we represented ourselves and mm. have some great, you know, memories from a really dark time because of those things. Mm. But yeah. Well, and it's a con, I think, you guys, no matter whether you would have changed anything or not, you've offered people so much hope. And I feel like that's a huge thing that in difficult circumstances, all of us have to make the choice whether or not we're going to do or not. But for the person listening who is trying to hone their life around the things that are valuable to them, the stories they want to share, the things that they maybe want to be vulnerable about or just have fun with, you know, like we've said before, it doesn't have to all be the big deep stuff. But for the person wanting to be undistracted, what would your advice be to them on how to, for one, find the thing that resonates with their spirit, but then also go after it with intention? Hmm. see that's a great question it's a big question i need this i need the person who knows the answer to tell me uh (laughs) the i would say um no gosh no kind of i think it's helpful i use this kind of the word goals is is a little scary sometimes but for the lack of better words like um sometimes it's just knowing your aim, what you're aiming for is, a, has been a really, uh, helpful tool for me. I use the analogy of like, I'm a, I'm a visual artist, but I'm not good at it. Mm. <laughs> I just, but I'm like, it doesn't make me, Hey, anyone can be a visual artist. You just got to put pen to paper, you know? Mm-hmm. And, uh, for, for me, a practice that I do, um, with that is, you know, a lot of times I try every morning to draw a picture 
And usually I don't like it and it frustrates me because I'm not great, but I do it regardless and I don't tear it out and I don't throw it away. And sometimes I'll hang it on the wall to, to make myself have to look at like <laughs> this thing that I don't love, but I think, but I tried, there, you know, and, yeah. and, and, uh, and my goal with that is not to go hang it in a gallery mm. or to sell it or to have even anyone else look at it other than me. It's kind of a refining craft with my music. Sometimes I'll very rarely will I just write a song for me. Usually I'm thinking I'm going to hang this, so to speak, in a gallery. Like mm. I'm inviting people in to see this work and to hear this work. And and you make um, different decisions, not compromising decisions, but you 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 operate differently in that. And I think there's a tool with uh, I think that's a helpful tool is just like, don't be too hard on yourself uh, regardless of if this is for someone else or mm. just for yourself. Um, yeah. But knowing kind of knowing your aim, like knowing what you're aiming for, knowing your goals is has been helpful for me. And I think I do think spending as much time in like silence and still places has helped me. Um, and I've, and, and I'm not great at that. I've just listened to a lot of people who encourage me to do that. Mm. And whenever I, whenever I feel, uh, this isn't my most fluid answer, but uh, whenever I feel like I'm wasting time mm. or not getting something done the, and, and, and have to discipline myself to step away, that's when I get most productive. It's mm. like, um, so um, I don't know. I think don't be afraid of the mundane yeah. Don't be afraid of slow pace and um, don't be afraid of even like obscurity. I've been like listening mm. to a podcast that talks about like we are a generation and kind of a world right now that that is built on celeb like fascinated with celebrity mm. and with platform and everyone is performing at some level with their life. Yeah. And the idea of kind of being obscure is terrifying, <laughs> but, but there's kind of a, in, there's a gift in that. Like, yeah. in, in think like, I guess going back to like drawing pictures that no one will ever see, mm. there's something, I mean, it's like the original journaling that's yeah. about as obscure as it gets. You yeah. Know? And it's like, it sounds like, you know, being willing to kind of actually craft a life, whether people see it or not craft something mm. that, you find pleasure in and that, that you'll actually be proud of. But Caleb, you've shared such great wisdom and advice with us. And thank you so much for opening up some of your life to us in your beautiful studio. It looks amazing. I uh, uh, can't claim it. It's definitely my dad's. <laughs> had, to, had to reposition the phone so you didn't see like his, his like all his gold <laughs> records in the background. Just so but that you yeah, can I'm claim that, it as I'm your own. I love yeah. that. That's great. Well, Caleb, thank you again for joining us. We really appreciate your time today. And I 100% will be front row at the first show you do in Australia. Let's go. We'll do it. It has to happen. Thanks for watching this Undistracted interview. I hope you enjoyed it. Let me know what you think in the comments below. And be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel so that you don't miss any of the others. Mm -hmm.